Thank you. Well, it's been really lovely being here today with you all. It's been a very special day for me. I like little churches because you wouldn't believe this, but when I was a little girl, I used to hide in cupboards at church so people didn't speak to me. <laughs> and my parents are really shocked that I now travel all over the world talking to people. It's a bit weird. Sometimes it's a bit weird for me too. But it, I like small churches because I feel like they're nice and cozy. Anyway, we're going to talk about balancing our emotions this afternoon. And there's going to be stuff, after a little bit, there's going to be stuff you can do together with those near you, little chats and things to try and do. And so if you're near your children, you know, talk to them a little bit as well. Um, just very short moments of things, just so you can get some idea. Let's start with a prayer. Father God, we thank you that we can be here on this Sabbath. Thank you for time to celebrate your love, for being together over lunchtime, for the wonderful food, the inspiring conversations. We thank you for all these beautiful and happy children that bring such joy and life to this church community. And this afternoon, we ask that you be with us as we learn about our emotions, because they're, they're quite complex at times, and yet you want us to experience the best emotions possible. And thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to sit down, because... I can. <laughs> and then I can see the screen and it's a bit more comfortable. So I'm going to talk about balancing our emotions in an unbalanced world because we certainly live in an unbalanced world. And what I learned about is that I can balance my emotions. Now, I never used to know about this. And probably I would be on the melancholic side, if you know about melancholic temperaments, probably, the, you know, the glass half empty, then the glass half full and looking at everything I could complain about. And, and I went through a bit of a tough time. And, um, and then I was asked to go and help create a website for children's well-being and be part of that. And while I was doing that, I learned that I could actually choose my emotions. That was a, a new insight to me. I just thought, oh, I'm sad. I'll have to be sad until I stop being sad. And then I realized that when I'm sad, you know, even if something really sad has happened, like someone has died, that it's very good that we also rebalance our emotions by choosing to do positive things that can really help us. And actually, when I started to think about this, I realized, okay, oh yeah, okay, that screen, get me to that screen. That's confusing me now. Um, I'll look at this one. Uh, when, when Paul wrote Philippians, he was in jail. He was on death row. And if there's ever, like, humanly speaking, a terrible place to be, would be in jail in Rome on death row. And I don't know whether he knew how he was going to die, whether you'd wake up one day and be fed to the lions or burnt at the stake or have your head chopped off or be put on a cross. I've no idea, but it, you know, none of the options are that great, are they? So there he was in jail awaiting execution, and he writes this amazing letter to the Philippians full of joy. And it's amazing, particularly when you go to chapter 4, it's full of good principles that are now research is telling are good for us. And Paul somehow knew this stuff. I never realized he was such a good psychologist before. But in Philippians 4, he packs it. These are just a few of them. He packs it with good principles in one verse at a time sort of thing that help us to balance our emotions. And that's how he helped himself in this really grim situation, basically some kind of awful lockdown that he was in. And so he says, praise God, praise God, because we can, whatever is going on in our life, God is always praiseworthy, right? He doesn't stop being praiseworthy, even if our life is challenging. There's always things we can praise God for. And he says, pray and give your worries to God, because if you can't do anything about them, just give them to God. And sometimes I get children to draw around their hand and cut it out, pretend it's the hand of God, or maybe mommy or daddy's hand, if that's a bit bigger, and then write their worries in the palm of that hand and imagine it's God's hand and they're giving them their worries to him. If they can't write, they can just scribble their worries and their God knows what they are. Um, and then fill yourself with the peace of God, he says. And I think we do that by looking at nature with wonder and remembering that all God has done for us. That's a way to experience peace. And we now know spending time in nature is really, really good for our well-being. And then he says, let your gentleness be evident to all. And kindness is actually one of the best ways to feel happy. Even thinking about doing someone kind for someone else makes us feel good. 
And then he says this famous verse, whatever things are pure, lovely, good report, think about those. So he says, choose what you think about. If thinking about the news makes you feel sad, don't think about the news, think about something else. There's plenty in the news to keep us constantly miserable. But he says, do you don't have to live in that place. You can think about wonderful things, positive things that are going on. Um, and there's actually websites that just share positive news. So go and look at them instead. The good research that's being done, people doing incredible things for others, you know, what ADRA is doing. There's many, many good things that we can find. So when we think about emotions, what are they? And they're actually invitations to connect. When I have a feeling, um, it's an invitation for you to connect with me. If I'm sad, Paul says, if, you're s if someone's sad, be sad with them. And that's connecting on that emotion. If I have a moment of wonder, I go, wow, there's a beautiful rainbow, and there's no one there to share it with, it's like, okay, there's a beautiful rainbow. And even if I take a photo of it, it's not going to look that great, and my husband's not here to share it with. You know, it's still a moment of wonder, but it's not the same. When you share it with someone, it's better. When you share your joy, it doubles, and when you share your sadness, it halves, said somebody. So emotions are just natural responses to living in this world. Stuff will make us happy, stuff will make us sad, and it's part of the richness of humanity. Jesus had all the different emotions. He got angry, frustrated, he was happy, he was peaceful, he was grateful. He experienced lots of different emotions just as we do. And uh, emotions tell, uh, uh, it's our body telling our brain and, and us how to respond appropriately in different situations. I have a great fear of heights, um, and I have a slightly wobbly eyesight, which means that heights seem a little bit more disorientating to me. And, um, and the great thing is, is that then I feel fear when I get near the edge of a cliff, and it makes me go away from the edge of the cliff and keep safe. So fear is useful. Um, and I'll be talking about negative and positive emotions, but when I talk about negative emotions, they're not bad emotions. They're the ones that drain you. They put your bank account into negative. Think about it like that. Your emotional bank account goes into, into the red. And then it's harder for us to manage everything else. Those feelings drain us. Positive emotions are the ones that put your bank account back up into the black. We feel, always feel a bit better when that happens, don't we? And that they fill us up and help us to flourish. So think about negative emotions pull the plug out of our energy and positive emotions recharge us. So they're not good or evil. Feelings, they're just information from our body. So don't ever shame someone and say, oh, you shouldn't feel like that. Um, they do. Um, so uh, to, to learn to respond more appropriately to their feelings. Um, and we can choose how we respond to feelings, which is, again, I say this is with this aha moment for me. I don't have to just be sad because I feel sad even though sad things are happening, I can choose to be positive. So what I do is, and um, how emotional balance works, is that there's little quizzes online you can do at positivityratio.com, and it will work out, you put in how much of all the negative emotions you've experienced in a day, how much of all the positive emotions, just roughly, and it will give you a balance, where are you at? So when I'm coming home from work now, I will check in with myself, and I can tell without doing the quiz, okay, a bit low on the positive emotions today. And on the bus on the way home, I will choose to do things that will make me feel better. So I will think of just simple things. It doesn't take much. Ten things I'm thankful for. I look out the window and find something that fills me with wonder. And even just the sky can fill you with wonder, particularly when it's ever-changing, not the sort of white sky, which is a bit boring, but... Um, often the sky is so incredibly beautiful and different. So I look out for moments of wonder, for gratitude. I might look for something funny to see online. Um, and I w I'll get off the bus stop and walk a nice way home rather than the nearest bus stop, which is not so nice. And I choose to do things that will make me feel better. And usually in the 15 to 20 minutes it takes me on the bus and then 10 minutes walk, by the time I get home, I'm often... I've rebalanced myself if I've had a stressful day. And that's what I learned, that I can check in where I am, see that I'm getting low, and then top myself up um, with very simple things. And I've actually written a whole um, 
like project on this called Flourish, which is on the Trans European Division website. If you Google Trans European Division Family Flourish, you'll go to um, a web page, and on the left, right, there's lots of different posters which you can click on and uh, download, and each one has 10 ideas for experiencing all of the positive emotions. And we're currently using them, um, doing a video for each one to help the ADRA volunteers working with Ukrainians to take care of themselves and learn how to help the refugees also care for their emotions. So it's a bit like a sailing boat on a sea. My dad used to sail boats and I used to sail with him. And life has its ups and downs and they're like waves. And when we have lots of negative emotions, imagine there's a lot of like heavy weights in your boat and it's sinking into the water and the water's coming over the edge and your boat isn't so much fun, it's kind of sluggish. And positive emotions are like the wind in the sails that it's really exciting when you sail and the wind is in your sails and it blows you over the water and you have the spray in your face, it's much more positive. So, so it, the positive emotions are like the wind that helps us have a, a good ride in life rather than get bogged down. Positive emotions are important for us because they don't just make us feel happy, they help us to recover from stress, they help us re build resilience in all of us that are children as well and face challenges, and they help us to be more loving and lovable people to be around. So they're really important. I actually, if you want to see this, if you Google Karen Holford um, balancing emotions, you'll find, I don't know how many videos of me doing this, so if you're rapidly taking notes, um, you can see it again, or I'll, I'll happily share the PowerPoint with you. So it's, it's been my most requested um, presentation all over the world, and that's why I created the materials for Flourish. So emotions are not shameful, they're just natural responses to life, and Jesus experienced negative and positive emotions, and it's important that we um, even let boys cry. Little boys need to cry and be comforted because that's actually how their brains develop empathy. And if we don't comfort children when they cry, then um, they uh, sometimes, if you see pictures of children's brains that have never been comforted when they cried and they've been around abusive situations, um, when they're about three and their brain rewires, you c there are like black holes in their brain where there should be empathy. There's nothing there. And so um, it their, their chances of becoming violent and aggressive and abusive are increased because we haven't learned to comfort them and they haven't their brains haven't learned what it means to be comforted and soothed. And so they don't know how to do that for others. So it's actually more serious than we think. So some negative emotions, they're just normal, healthy responses. If someone dies or you lose something, then sadness is just normal. Um, and it's an invitation for people to comfort you, to help you. Um, but some other negative emotions can really drag you down into despair and you can really feel overwhelmed and crushed. You might get more anxious, maybe more depressed and even burnt out. And so knowing how to balance your emotions can really help you. Most people, when I heard this, I thought this was really good news. Most people have a two to one ratio of positive to negative emotions. I thought, that's pretty good going. Twice as many positive as negative. Um, I thought, wish I felt like that when I first heard it. <laughs> I'm not sure I feel that it's quite that much for me. But actually, the ratio is much better uh, when you have at least three to one positive to negative emotions. Interestingly, they said the research, the ratio um, of the baseline balance is about the same as the ratio for pi, which is interesting. I don't know why, but anyway. Um, and positivityratio.com talks about this. So what are some of the negative emotions that come into our lives? Um, we'll try and do these quickly. These are them, and I'll, I'll describe them, so that's just a basic list. So anger, we all know what anger is. It's feeling displeasure, hostility, or antagonism towards someone or something. And we can help people by listening calmly, showing that we want to understand, helping them to look for win-win solutions I could do a whole other seminar on anger um, because it's quite complex. But the thing to remember with anger, it's actually a secondary emotion. You feel something else first, and then you get to anger. And if you know what the first thing is, it's easier for you to deal with it. Because sometimes people are angry when they're actually sad or when they're afraid or when they feel guilty 
and uh, there's all sorts of feelings that might have come before someone got to anger. And if you can think what that is, you can often help them deal with that emotion. Contempt is actually a really bad emotion for us. It's quite toxic to the body when we are contemptuous towards others and feel superior to them. So we need to remember that we're all beloved children of God um, and look for the good in others. Don't look down on them. Um, disgust is a feeling of being revolted by something that smells or tastes or looks horrible. Ugh. And I used to have a picture on here of a child with an octopus on their plate. And the child was going like, oh like this, uh, this horrible octopus. But I, I work in Greece sometimes, and the, re <laughs> the response was like, mmm. You know, so I had to change the picture. Well, I was doing outreach to the community. These weren't Adventists, by the way. So I <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to find pictures of disgust, but this lion, well, he's got his tongue out. So, And then there's embarrassment, the feeling that something you did wrong or, or badly will be made public. Everyone is going to find out about what you did wrong, and you're just, like, mortified. Um, and that happens a lot on social media, and it's very destructive for teenagers' well-being. So help them not to add to each other's embarrassment. I mean, I think there's even been suicides when this has been really severe in really severe cases. So we don't want to be part of damaging someone's mental health. Um, so lift up those who've been embarrassed. Don't add to their shame. Talk about what they did well. Help them to feel special. So fear is being anxious about something that possible or probable situation that you feel unable to handle well. You think, oh no, I'm going to have to deal with this difficult situation. And our fears are often based on traumatic past experiences. So I had this really funny fear, and you probably think, it's not daft, but I can sometimes be really afraid of escalators. Sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I'm so terrified I have to find another way. And that's because I lived in Africa and I came back from Africa when I was three. And the first thing they did is take me to a department store and buy me a bridesmaid's dress because I was going to be my aunt's wedding. And somebody put me on an escalator in front of them and I'd never seen an escalator before. And I was like totally freaked out. My mum couldn't take me on an escalator for years. And there's some times when I get to the top and I go, oh, I can do this one. And the other times I go, <gasps> Maybe not today. I'll see where the lift is. And, and it's a bizarre thing. I know in my head it's safe, but it doesn't feel safe to me because I have this, um, I get unbalanced when I see, see cliffs and things. Partly came from that experience when I came back from Africa. So a lot of our fears are based on experiences we had as small children when we didn't have words to express our fears and we weren't in control. Um, and what do we do for fear? Perfect love casts out fear. So my husband has actually walked two kilometers with me when I wouldn't go down an escalator to the underground. It's like, okay, we can just walk. So, so frustration is, we've all felt that, haven't we? we? We want to get to a goal and something is stopping us or we're doing our best and someone criticizes us. And we're like, <coughs> that's not fair. And we have to take a deep breath, look for some other solutions, ask for help. Guilt feeling remorseful, sad, or responsible when you've hurt someone or a relationship is broken. And it's actually really important to put things right the same day. If we sleep on a broken relationship, a conflict, this is why the Bible says, um, do it before the sun goes down. Because actually when you sleep and your brain filters all the, the data from the day, if a, an unsolved conflict goes into the brain, we now know it's more likely to cause depression and anxiety. And they first discovered that in teens, that if they had a, a rift with their parents and they went to sleep on it, it was more likely to, call to cause depression and anxiety. Um, and so if you do fall out with your teenagers, make up with them the same day before they go to bed. And you might think, well, hmm, they should come and apologize to me. You know, they said that rude word. But quite often they don't know how to. So go to them and say, let's make up. You know, you're forgiven. Let's, let's put things right before bedtime because it's really important. So sadness is, comes for all sorts of reasons, and we need to listen, comfort, be sad with people, and that's what they need from us, not judgment or, or we shouldn't feel so sad or just ignoring them. They need people to listen, comfort, and be sad with them. Shame is bad. Um, it's a bit like guilt, um, but it's usually not because you've done something wrong. It's someone putting you down in a terrible way. 
And so try to lift people up uh, when you're with them. Something that I've now tried to do is whenever I'm having a conversation with anybody, leave aim to leave them lifted up a bit and blessed uh, and not feeling worse in any way. Stress is feeling that you're asked to do more than you can manage and if you don't get it all done, you'll be seen as a failure and there's different things we might need to do there. Um, reduce stress, ask for help, learn to say no kindly and be kind to yourself. But those are the negative emotions and we want to look at the, the happy ones so it's good to know what they are and to realize how much of them might be in your life. But here are some positive emotions, and we're going to have fun at enjoying some of these. So they are amusement and laughter, gratitude, inspiration, joy, serenity, hope, an interest or a hobby, and I'll explain more about that, feeling valued, awe and wonder, and love. So we experience... Um, yeah, amusement and laughter is really good. Laughing and smiling are something unexpected, unusual, and safe. We laugh with people and not at people. Laugh laughing at is contempt. That's not a nice thing. Laughing with is, is fun. And it's so nice to, to laugh with people about crazy things that, that happen. A cheerful heart is good medicine, said the wise man. So... What we used to do when we met as a family, when our children were at home, every evening when we sat around to dinner, we'd say the funniest thing that happened in the day or share a funny joke we'd heard or a, a funny you know, email, YouTube clip or whatever. Um, watch a funny movie together. And you can just watch something funny on the internet for a minute. You know, there's like funny cat videos or whatever. Animals can be very funny. Um, and tell each other what makes you laugh the most. So I'm going to get you to turn to the next person and, and tell them something funny that happened to you, okay, um, in the last week. So think if you could think of something funny. If you both can't, if one of you can, that's fine. We won't have very long to do this. So tell the other person something funny or show them a funny picture. Okay, are you ready to move on or are you enjoying the laughter? It's so lovely to see you all laughing, it's really nice. It's just like burst into the room, all oh, this laughter. And do you feel better for having a bit of a laugh? Yeah, it doesn't take much, does it? So, um, share funny moments with each other that happen in the day. The next thing is awe and wonder. And it's going, wow, at something you see in nature. And when I was locked down and I was walking every day trying to get my walks outside, I used to take my phone and I would ask God every day to show me something of wonder in his creation. And I'd take a photograph of it. And I had the same boring walk pretty much every day. There wasn't anywhere nice much to walk from my house. So it was, you know, a suburban neighborhood. But... Um, I would see squirrels or beautiful um, flowers or interesting, you know, like now you see these beautiful leaves on the floor. Last week, I was in the new forest with my husband and I have never seen so many different fungi. Almost every step we took, we could see amazing different fungi that I'd never seen before. 
and, um, and just being filled with wonder at the autumn colours. So I wonder what's filled you with wonder recently. Maybe you have a picture on your phone. Maybe you saw something. What has made you go, wow, in God's creation recently? And slow down, really look at something. You know, sometimes you go, oh, that's a nice bunch of flowers. But really go up and look at the flower. I mean, God put a lot of effort into that flower. And you just go, yeah, that's a nice flower. Like, have you ever looked, you know, inside a rose or, or really how a leaf looks or how a caterpillar moves? So slow down with your children, with each other, and look at things for wonder. Notice what you haven't seen before. And sometimes I, can, I could need a moment of wonder. Maybe I'm stressed. I'm sitting in a hospital waiting room and it has no windows. And I'm like, you know what? My hand is amazing. I think my eye is amazing, but I can't see my eye. So I look at my hand and I move it and think all the things that my hand can do. And I go, wow, I have a hand that does stuff that monkeys can't do. Like, this is just an amazing tool that we have. And so try and find something that, that fills you with wonder. I'm, I'm quite easy to please. I can get filled with wonder looking at a blade of grass because I can't do that stuff. I can't make a blade of grass. And the fact that grass is green and restful and soft and when you cut the top off, it still keeps growing. It's pretty amazing, but we take it for granted a lot. But I like daisies and grass and I can be filled with wonder at those. So um, it kind of helps. But you find moments of wonder. So did I tell you to share a moment of wonder with each other? Did you do that? No, okay, just share a moment of wonder with each other, just either a photo or say what fills me with wonder is, da da, and just share quickly, okay? <laughs> so, children, what's your favorite thing in nature? What do you like that God's made? Maybe you could draw it, tell your parents later. And if you take photographs of these things and share them on your social media, you share the wonder with others, and they'll go, wow. And you'll share the positive emotion with them. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll move on from that moment of wonder and go into gratitude, thankfulness. Because often wonder inspires gratitude in us. So, and Paul says, give thanks in all circumstances. He doesn't say for all circumstances, but in. So even when we're in a bad place, we can still think of things to be thankful for. And one Christian psychologist says that we should list 30 things we're thankful for before we get out of bed in the morning to give our brain a positive boost. Some of us might be late for work, but you can give it a go. <coughs> think of 30 things you're thankful for on the way to work or um, on the way home or with your family. So something that we used to do as a family is name something we're thankful for beginning with every letter of the alphabet just to push our creativity a bit. You know, there are thousands of things in your house you have never thanked God for. So go into a room with your family and start thanking God for those things. And if you can't thank him for them, why is it still in your house, okay? Um, but also, you can walk down the road. I'll sometimes walk down the road, and I'll say, thank you, God, for that beautiful tree. Thank you for the person coming towards me for their life. Thank you for that bird I can hear singing. And just one thing after another as I'm walking, thank God for what I'm aware of. Um, it's good to start a gratitude diary as well. It's really an important thing to do, and I know a lot of people talk about it, but it's very positive at the end of the day to think of three things you're thankful for. You know, one day, um, my husband and I used to have a, a gratitude diary. When we were first married, we were unsponsored students at Andrews University. We had no money, um, very little. And we had a gratitude diary. And one day, lots of things had gone wrong, which had meant that even the little money we had was not going to be useful anymore. 
we couldn't buy the things we needed from the grocery store to eat, and we were, I was really upset at the end of the day. I was like, what am I going to put in the thank you diary today? Life has been terrible kind of thing. And Bernie goes, okay, Karen, let's give it a go. And you know, that day we wrote down six things we were thankful for because we had to look harder. So it's a good thing to do. And there's a very good video called A Good Day with brother David Steindl Rast. I think that's his name. It might be Rindel Stas. I don't know. It's, it's something like that. <laughs> but if you, if you Google a good day, this man has a whole website called gratefulness.org or something like that. And this little video is only a few minutes long. And he talks about being thankful that we can just switch a light on at a switch and turn the tap and there's water and simple things that we just take for granted. Hope is the belief that things can and will change and improve. And, you know, we have this hope, don't we? And that keeps us going a lot. Um, but what gives you hope when life is particularly challenging? What are you looking forward to right now? What are your children's hopes? What are your hopes for your life? Do you even know what, your, what people in your family are hoping for, hoping to do, hoping they can experience? Um, sometimes we don't have those conversations. And it's important that we always have something to look forward to in our family. It really helps our emotional well-being when we know, okay, the here's a rough patch, but for the weekend, we're going to go away, we're going to go have a meal out, we're going to have this party, we're going to see these friends, we're going to do something at church. And I think that's why God gave his people so many celebrations. They were all, there was always a party to look forward to, a festival in, in um, the Jewish calendar, and um, so there was always something to be joyful about and look forward to. And share your fun times with others. So if someone's down, give them some hope by saying, let's go and do this next week or come to my house or find out what they really want to do and, and take them to do it, even if they don't have the money or energy. So inspiration is being inspired by God, recognizing excellence in other people, so if someone does something amazing, a beautiful piece of music, a, an athlete, and you go, wow, that's inspiring. I want to, I wish I could play the piano like that. I wish I could run like that. And those are good moments for us. So what inspires you? Who in the Bible is most inspirational? Um, who in your life has inspired you? And have you ever told them that? You really inspired me. Um, what else inspires you? And how do you inspire other people? You know, you can even be inspired by a child. I'll tell you a story um, about the child who was about two or three. Mummy was praying with her at bedtime, and they just said a simple, mummy said a simple prayer about be with us, whatever we're going to do tomorrow kind of thing. And when the child um, opened her eyes after the prayer, she said, mummy, tomorrow we have to go and visit Mrs. Jones and take her some flowers. Mummy was surprised. Mrs. Jones went to their church. They hadn't seen her for a while. They didn't really know her that well. Um, but the little girl knew this lady's name and what she looked like. And the next day, the little girl said, Mummy, Mummy, we've got to go to Mrs. Jones and take her flowers. We've got to go this morning. And um, so Mummy says, OK, we'll go out in the garden and you can pick some flowers. And they had, it was the summer, they had lots of colored flowers. Um, and this little girl's favorite color was pink but she didn't pick any pink flowers or any blue flowers or any white flowers. She only picked purple flowers. Mummy was quite surprised. Anyway, they drove to Mrs. Jones' house and they knocked on Mrs. Jones' door and the little girl was there holding this bunch of purple flowers. And when Mrs. Jones opened the door, she burst into tears. She said, yesterday my life was so bad that I prayed to God, God, if you care about me, send someone tomorrow with purple flowers. And I wonder how many adults he spoke to before the, three, before the three-year-old who listened and was willing to be obedient. Isn't that inspirational that a three-year-old was listening to God and could make a difference? So, yeah, so children, you can be inspiring and inspired and you can make a difference too in the way you love each other. Now, we all need something that distracts us when we're having a, a hard time. And I wonder what it is for you. We need a, a nice hobby that just takes us away from all the, all the worries in our world, the anxieties. Um, and the Proverbs 31 lady, I mean, she did all kinds of stuff. She ran her own business. She did needlework. She made clothes. She gets up and makes breakfast for her servant girls. I mean, 
I think that should be the other way around, right? <laughs> but she's really, she's really amazing. And it's very, very, very important for us to have a hobby and help our children to have a hobby. Something that they can do, which they just lose themselves in, whether it's doing something with Lego, reading, um, preferably not on a screen, um, playing a musical instrument. I like to embroider and sew and create things. I like to write. And so what is it for you that takes your mind off everything that you really enjoy doing? Because it's very important that we can give our brain a brain break when we're feeling stressed by doing something that takes our mind off it, that is soothing and repetitive. People who do crafts, it's actually very good for their mental health or gardening, those sorts of things, because they just get absorbed in what they're doing, and it's a positive um, activity. So what are your favorite hobbies? Do you know what your children's favorite things are to do? Maybe just tell each other. The thing that I do when I want to take a brain break, my favorite hobby is this, and just to share that with each other. Okay. So I hope you shared your good hobbies. Mm -hmm. And it's quite good to know what each other's hobbies are. You know, when I was a little girl in my church, a lady who was still alive and in her 90s, she was a GP, and the GP surgery was in her house, and she came to our church. She knew that I liked to be creative and make things. And nearly every week, she would go into her work room, go to the magazines, pull out the craft pages and bring them to me in church. And just doing that interaction, that intergenerational interaction, and we've done this in some churches. We've given children, uh, linked them with an older person, and the parents can help make sure everything is safe and that. But the child comes to church to bless the older person and does things for them, maybe makes them a bookmark or tells them a story or prays for them. And the older person does what they can to bless the young person. And this is what this lady did for me. And I still have what she gave me in the 1960s. And I have never forgotten. It made me feel significant as a tiny, shy child in this church. This lady who was a doctor who was extremely busy would think about me when she wasn't at church and bring this to me. So try and create that experience within your community. Um, in one church, the children made badges for the older people that said, I'm a beloved child of God. And they came in from Sabbath school, and they pinned them on all the old people. And some of the old people cried. They had never before realized that they were a beloved child of God. Isn't that a blessing? So you can bless each other. Joy is a feeling of happy delight and freedom. And I, I love to just walk in nature. That gives me so much joy. And it's different to laughter. You know, laughter, and something can be funny, but something can be joyful and give you joy. And it can be like walking into a cathedral. And it's sometimes it's a mix with, with gratitude and wonder and other things. But joy is a good thing. So think about the happiest thing that happened to you in the last week. And, and maybe share that with another person just very quickly. What's the happiest thing that happened to you in the last week? I hope something happy happened to you in the last week. If not... I hope someone is, makes you feel happy today. <laughs> mm -hmm.
So I hope you enjoyed sharing your happy moments. I can see the happy faces and know that that's good for you. Something else we need is a sense of purpose and value, that what we do is valued by other people, that our life is special and meaningful to others. And um, sometimes we need to tell each other that, you know, when you did that, that was so special to me. I really valued that, and I'm so glad that you're in my life. And um, I, once, I once told my three-year-old grandson, I spent a day with him when he was three, and all through the day, I was telling him that he was special to me because I know this is important. So I was letting Leo know he was valued by me all through the day. I love spending time with you. I'm so glad you're my grandson. This is so much fun being with you. And he would look at me like, Grandma's saying funny things today, this kind of, hmm. And about 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and maybe it's because we were making cakes, but anyway, he stops and he says, Grandma... I wish you always lived with us. And isn't that amazing? So all day I had been feeding him, you are valued, you are special to me. And then he was able to say, a three-year-old could say back to me, Grandma, I wish you always lived with us. And yeah, it might have been the cakes, but hey, it was a nice thing for him to say. <laughs> so it's really good for us at the end of the day to think about what went well. Because, you know, often at the end of the day, we get into bed and we're like, oh, no, today I did this wrong, did that wrong, and that went wrong. <sighs> and you can feel discouraged. You know, we're praying for forgiveness and we're cataloging our list of catastrophes. And, yes, we do need to pray for forgiveness. But most of the time, probably 95% of the time, we're all doing, like, really good stuff, really well. But we just fixate on the percent that went wrong so it's really important to focus on three things that went well at the end of the day and tell tell your children these are three things you did well today tell your teenagers I was so proud of you today when I saw this this and this and think for yourself what did I do well today as a family therapist I'm sometimes working with families where the mothers say I haven't done anything well I'm a rubbish mother Social services have a file this thick on how bad I am. And I say, at the end of the day, are your children still alive? And then she says, yeah. I said, well, I've been a mom. I know, that's, that's, that's hard. <laughs> I have a son who broke 15 bones before he left home. So, <laughs> so I, you know, I've been pushed to the limits on this. So if they're, if they're alive, that's an incredible thing. Did you feed them today? Yes. So they're alive and they're fed. And where are they now? They're in bed. So you did a really good job. They're alive, you fed them, and they're now in bed. That's a good job, well done. Don't underestimate what it takes to do that. So help people to think about what they did well. Serenity is a lovely sense of peacefulness. <coughs> and, um, and we often find that in nature. When, um, when Paul says, the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And we have peace because we know we're loved, peace because we're forgiven, peace because we know there's a life beyond this. Make a list of all the things you know about God that bring you peace. And find a place where you can be quiet and peaceful and pray. And I learned to do, people actually have a name for this now, they call it bubble breathing. And I discovered it by accident when my children were little. I had a really stressful day. I had three small children, and I said to Bernie, I'm just going out in the garden for a moment. I just need to gather my thoughts. <sighs> so stressed. So I went out in the garden, and there was a pot of children's bubbles on the picnic table. And I just absently minded, picked this up, and started blowing bubbles. And, you know, in two minutes, I felt calm. And I do that now, because sometimes... Um, Actually, I feel really nice and safe here, and it's lovely. But sometimes I talk in very stressful contexts, and I'm thinking, <gasps> you know, here's shy Karen going out in front of here, and she's going to speak to these people, and I really would rather be in a cupboard. And I pretend to blow bubbles, so I take a deep breath. So, and just imagine, do it with me. Take a deep breath, and imagine you're trying to blow a really big bubble without it popping. and then watch it float away, yeah, dee, yeah, dee, yeah. and then another one. <gasps> yeah, dee, yeah, dee, yeah. You know, like that. And you can just imagine that if you do that three or four times, it will naturally 
um, stimulate the calming part of your body, things that calm you down. And you can really go, oh, yeah, I'm cool again now. So um, if someone's getting stressed, if your children are getting stressed, if you are, blow some bubbles or pretend to blow bubbles or smell lavender or citrus or bake some bread or play some soothing music or focus on a peaceful Bible verse. When I'm blowing out, I often go, be still and know that I am God. Like, you just be still. Like, God's in, God's in control. Whatever's going on here, he's, he's sorting it. And that helps me to feel peaceful, too, as well. And then there is um, love, which is a blend of all these lovely emotions in a, you know, together, which is what you've been doing here. Do these things together. Share wonder together. Love together. Create together. Um, be grateful together. And, uh, and love... If you know about the five love languages, it can be kind words, being helpful, having thoughtful gifts, someone spending time with you, physical affection. Find out how each other likes to be loved and do that. Love is kind. And as I mentioned before, being kind to others is really good for our emotional well-being. When I worked on this project, a psychologist said to me, I hate to tell you this, I know you're a therapist, but getting people to be kind to others has been shown to be more effective than medication and counseling in many types of depression, not all, but in many. Um, when we start to be kind, it um, stimulates the oxytocin in our brain, helps us to feel happier. Even just thinking about doing something kind can be helpful. And if you know someone who's really too, <sighs> too heavy and sad to do something kind for others, say, hey, I'm going to go and do this. Come with me. Let's do it together. Just come along for the ride and get them involved. Kindness is one of the most important things that we can nurture in, in our communities and in our children. It's so good for them. I think it's the most important character strength we can develop. And actually on my website, if you, it's not easy to find, if you get stuck, email me and let me know. But we've got hundreds of ideas under a project called Live Kind to be kind in your community. And we were having a good chat about kindness at lunchtime, and uh, I sometimes challenge churches that in a year's time, Doncaster has a prize for the kindest church, and you win it. The Seventh-day Adventist Church wins it. What will you do between now and then so that you win that prize, okay? So the thing is, our thoughts, our behavior, and emotions, they're all connected. When we, when we have happier emotions, we have more positive thoughts, more positive behavior, and that helps us to feel better, but it can go the other way around. If we start to have Negative feelings, negative thoughts, negative behavior. We all know how that can go. And it's kind of a matter of perspective because we can focus on the dark and gloomy aspect of life. Like this picture, it looks quite dark. But this picture is at the back of this, the end of this pathway here. So we can just focus on the dark bit. But we can step back and go, wow. Paul says, focus on what's beautiful and lovely. And we can take a step back. And even when life is hard, go, we can still be thankful. We can still have moments of wonder. We can still be kind to each other. And all those things will help us with all of our complex, draining emotions. <coughs> There's an NHS website in the UK, and, I, and it talks about emotional wellness through five things. Connect with others emotionally, spiritually, and socially, which is what you're doing here. Be active. That's also one of our important principles as Adventists, being healthy and active. Pay attention to the details of nature and relationships. Have moments of wonder, basically. Give generously. We are people who give are more happy than those who don't give, who keep everything to themselves. And keep learning and growing, and that's also what our church promotes. So you can make yourself a list of all the ways you like to experience positive emotions. I often tell people, make yourself a little box or a basket where you keep things that help you connect with your positive emotions. You can do it for your children, for yourself. Find out what they like. You can have a book of um, funny stories. You can have an inspirational book, a peaceful playlist, some bubbles, some hand cream to rub into your hands that will calm you down, um, a gratitude list, a thank you card where you can write lots of thank yous in, um, all sorts of things in there, a smiley person to help remind you of joy. And how can we help other people? So with our children, we can be a good example 
we can let them know how we manage our negative emotions. We often don't talk about that. But you could just have a simple conversation like this. You know, today I got so frustrated at work. Can you explain what frustration is? I had a big project. I needed to do some copying. Photocopier broke down. And I thought, what am I going to do? This needs to get ready in half an hour. And then I calmed down. I remembered my friend has a photocopier in her office. Asked her if I could use it. She said, yes, of course. Phew, and I got it sorted. So you tell, help them identify the emotion. Um, take some deep breaths, think about what they can do and go and find a solution. So when we talk actually about how we manage our negative emotions, our children will learn a lot from that. The more words our children have for their emotions, the better they are, the more emotionally intelligent they are. And they can talk about things rather than get aggressive and throw things around because they feel bad but they don't know why and so they just act it out. Listen for emotions and tell people, oh, that sounds like, that sounds really discouraging or that sounds really sad or, or frustrating or whatever it is um, and help them to name them, respond to them and say, how can I help you with that? What can I do if you're, how can I encourage you if you're discouraged? How can I help you feel happy if you're sad? Encourage people to find their own solutions. Don't just tell them, oh, you should go and do this. Help children to find their own solutions to their problems. So you've fallen out with your friends in the classroom. Um, what happened? Um, what could you do to mend it again? What are some other ideas that you have? Uh, maybe you help them go on the internet and look for ideas, but you can be part of helping them to solve that problem and learning a process to solve their problems. Help everyone to find a hobby that they love, that they can lose themselves in. We all need that to keep us healthy, whether it's running. My husband does running. I, I do creative things and writing, and I like to take photographs of nature. <coughs> um, then laugh. You know what? When we laugh, we learn better. Some teachers now will make their children laugh in the classroom because they learn better when they laugh. It relaxes their brains. Imagine their brain then just goes, pew, relaxes, opens up like a sponge and all the information can go in. But if they're afraid or sad, then their brain just goes, I'm not letting anything else in. There's in too much in here already. So laughter is really good to help us learn. <coughs> we can be positive role models by filling our own life with positive emotions and sharing them with our children. Hey, I'm going to go and do this kind thing. Hey, let's be grateful together. Hey, let's go and look. Let's look at this. The way this snail moves, be filled with wonder at even a snail. Turn a log over and look at all the creepy crawlies underneath. If you've got little boys, they love it. <coughs> um, help them to find a place to be quiet and peaceful because often all of us rush around too much and we don't have moments to be quiet and think. And make really happy, healthy choices. Once you know how this works and you have a rough day, you can go, I remember what Karen said. Let's, let me just think of some things I'm thankful for, or let, let me go and do something that makes me feel better. And try and rebalance yourself in the evening in some way so that you, <coughs> you don't go to bed feeling stressed and anxious. Focus on the positive. There's plenty there. So when I work with families, sometimes I get them to make an emotional pie of how they're feeling inside and say, imagine it's a pie chart, put your emotions in here, and let's just see what you're feeling. Or I might get a parent to guess what's going on in a child and a child to guess what's going on in a parent. I did that and an eight-year-old was a better guesser at the parent's emotions than the parent was at the child's. It was unbelievable. And I had one little girl and she said, this is, this is my emotional pie here. And she said, this section here, that's all the, emo that's all the feelings I don't have words for yet. I was like, wow. That's really insightful. Most adults wouldn't say that. And then she said, you called it a pie. And the pie, this is just the inside bit. And the inside bit was probably 80% negative and 20% happy. I mean, she was really in a difficult situation in her life. And she said, I'm going to draw my pie lid. And her pie lid was 80% happy and 20% sad. That's what she showed on the outside. But inside, it was completely the other way around. And once she and her mother could see that was what, she was, what was going on, and they could use this very simple tool to check in with each other. They didn't need to come back much anymore. <coughs> so you can say, when I th I'm most likely to feel this emotion when I show it by doing this, and when I feel this, I need other people to do this for me, to help me. So we've kind of raced through this, and I hope you've 
taking some things away that are useful. And if you want to know more, if you go to the website Trans European Division, um, just search Trans European Division Family Flourish. That's where you'll get all these posters with each one of these positive emotions and 10 different simple creative ideas you can do easily in your home with stuff you already have there. They're all designed to be really simple, really low cost, really easy, so that you have a lot of ideas, much more than I've shared with you. So think about what you've just learned, what new ideas interest you the most, what you're going to do in the next year, and the next week, not next year, but yeah, next year too. Um, you might as well make a long-term plan for your well-being. Um, but try and um, experience more positive emotions for yourself and encourage others to as well. And finally, I have a funny video, and I hope this works. So um, if not, if the sound doesn't work, it doesn't matter because you can see everything on the screen. Um, but it's a lovely thing to end with, and it's about joy. Please see if this works. Come on. I hope you enjoyed that ride. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life more abundantly. And when we do these things intentionally, they're all things he wants us to experience. And as Christians, we know so many ways to experience these positive things, and we know why. And when we do them, when we choose to do them, we experience the abundant life that he wants for us. And we can flourish and be more resilient in this crazy life that un that's unbalanced, this unbalanced world we can learn how to balance ourselves a little more. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you for the way that you have made us so incredibly, so amazingly. Thank you for our minds, our emotions, all our different personalities. Thank you that you've given us so much creativity as well. And we want to thank you that in this world of unbalanced emotions, even though we do experience the negative ones and they they can be helpful as well in their natural responses to this crazy world. We thank you for all the positive emotions that you have created. Help us to choose to engage with those things that you have put in our minds and bodies in this world to give us joy and share those with others to inspire them and heal them too. And we pray for each person here. May they be blessed. May they flourish. May they have abundant lives with positive emotions, and we look forward to the day with our hope that you will come back and one day we will live with you with only positive emotions forever and ever. We thank you for that incredible hope and your incredible love through Jesus' name. Amen.